Next, we're going to move on to uh, Zane Sloan and Sarah Gabe. Zane Sloan is a civil engineer with Arcadis IBI Group. Most of his career has been focused on road infrastructure planning, design, and construction. In 2014, Zane began refocusing his career toward the challenges of its adaptation to climate change. Sarah is a geotechnical engineer with the BC Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. Most of her career has been focused on geotechnical work associated with road infrastructure, including foundations, slope stability, and landslide design. Sarah's current role is engineering direct director for the Caribou Road Recovery Projects. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Zane and Sarah, and we'll pass it over to you. All right, I have too many slides, so I'm gonna go pretty fast. So next slide. Just wanted to show you the uh, the heart of the machine here in uh, British Columbia. And in, in a heart, there's four chambers. And what we see here on the right side are, are four cells here. Uh, basically, PyBC came up with the protocol right back in 2000, started in 2005, but I'm starting the story around 2006, about 17 years ago. That's when the ministry really started getting engaged in this realm. And by 2010 to 2014, that first box you see in the flow chart, that's when they undertook the PyBC protocols. Then they, the second part of the chamber, they got the best practices guidance. And then the next part of the chamber, they got the technical, technical circular, the technical standards and policies established. And then knowing the high risk items that we have here in province that's when we're getting to more detailed climate risk assessments and that's that bottom part of the flow chart next slide please just wanted to point out how this aligns with the flow chart from the climate lens from infrastructure canada first step get your vulnerabilities figured out. And then you figure out your medium and high risk items to get into detailed climate risk assessments. And of course the end product is here to select and implement relevant resilience measures. And that's where we're all headed. Next slide, please. So this is just to show the five PIVC protocol assessments that the province undertook between 2010 to 2014 and encompasses a range of climatological conditions in British Columbia. Next slide, please. Out of, uh, they grouped uh, infrastructure into many, many categories, uh, almost 100 or so, but in the end, they realized, they came to the conclusion that there are 14 categories at high risk in the province, uh, and five climate hazard events are largely responsible for these high risk things happening. Next slide, please. Of course, once they figured out what was at high risk, they, that's when they developed these best practices. Next slide, please. This is the policy, the technical circular, that was important basically to tell engineers, if you design infrastructure for the province, you got to take climate change into account. Next slide, please. Now, 2020, 2021, we get a bunch of landslides in the middle of the province. Uh, this is the Caribou Road Recovery Project. Next slide, please. It's located here in the province in the middle, right in between all of those other privacy protocols that were done previously. Next slide, please. But then, of course, as everyone is aware, that the November flood disaster happened here. And I'll even read off some of the things that were discovered that, that were at high risk, such as, and you can see them all destroyed here, embankment cuts, hillsides, debris torrents, structures that cross streams, that's your bridges, river training works, pretty much anything in the water, culverts, asphalt spillways, in-stream habitat works, off-channel habitat works, and of course, what was the culprit? Precipitation events, extreme hazard events, and that's what was theorized during the privacy protocols and now confirmed here as the disasters really started to hit British Columbia. Next slide, please. Enter stage left, the PIVC high level screening guide. So this came out in February, 2022, and we realized we can undertake this, use this tool for a detailed climate risk assessment, looking more closely at these 14 categories at high risk. Next slide, please. So what do we do? We take that PIVC high level screening guide spreadsheet, we pre-populated it, pre-populated it with these five climate hazards and these elements that we know that are already at high risk. And we want to give this pre-populated spreadsheet to the design team so that they can start to populate it with the actual infrastructure they're currently designing that fall under these categories that are at high risk. And I got a gold bar on the right side where I say, this is the gold. This is really what we're after here. We want to have these conversations with the design team about these high risk elements, considering these climate hazard events to figure out, is there still anything at high risk in their design as they're currently designing it? Next slide, please. 
So this is the, the first uh, project we undertook. It was for the Kersley Dale Landing Road project. And what you see here is the alignment of the road alongside the Fraser River. We can see in this air photo the difference between forested areas and, and where the drainage arrows go. Those polygons are the drainage catchments that we needed to consider along the way. Next slide, please. We also, of course, had the design plans to go along with it, profiles, cross sections, and plan views. Next slide, please. This is what the actual, the end product, after we undertook workshops with design teams, this is what it looks like from a distance, right? And what did it pull out? What did it identify? It identified what's at low risk, medium risk, and where there is still anything at high risk. Next slide, please. Now, how did we come to this conclusion? Well, we looked at those five climate events, such as maximum one-day precipitation, maximum five-day precipitation, uh, the river flows, then the snow melt. But we added three more, and we called them affected slopes. This was to take into consideration for compounding and sequential events, such as scorched earth or mountain pine beetle or land use changes, logging roads, uh, rain on snow melt events, and, and things like that to expand our consideration uh, of, of risks. Next slide, please. All right, and of course, we had to assign our likelihood scores, and that's what Jeff alluded to in his presentation there, talking about the uh, middle baseline method. And what we were looking for here was the trend. So I was working with Jeff O'Driscoll on this, actually, and, and he and I uh, went to climatedata.ca, took a look at the trends for these, you know, maximum one-day precipitation, maximum five-day precipitation, and we saw the trends going up. We had a meeting with Pacific Climate Impact Consortium to get a better idea too of, of climate trends in this area. And we did have, so we assigned our likelihood scores typically three, four, five, middle baseline method using a three for present day, four for the 2050s and, and five for the 2080s because that's where the trend was going. We did not have data when it came to river flows. So we assumed, well, we're looking for risks. So let's, let's assume that that is also increasing. The trend is going up. So you can see we indicated to indicate that as a, as a dash for the present day, that a plus for the 2050s and a plus plus for the 2080s indicating an upward trend. And that was our assumption trying to uncover the actual risks. Next slide, please. This is uh, from the Kersley Dale Landing Road project. Out of those 14 categories at high risk that were identified during the protocols, this project only actually had five of the categories at high risk in their project. So that's the embankment cuts and uh, constructed and, 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 and and existing, uh, hillsides existing. Uh, then we got our culverts there, less than three meters. We had a, a number of culverts to consider. Emergency responses, and of course the road sub-base we considered as well. Next slide, please. So that was where we got together in a workshop uh, using a bit of a middle, middle baseline method approach as well to assign the consequence scores. And really this was the whole thing, the whole workshop really just focused on these consequence scores. And of course the discussion that went along with it, which we recorded with a diligent scribe who was recording the consequences and the discussions along the way. Next slide, please. Here's what we found. Here's I'm circling here uh, from our spreadsheet what came out as, as a high risk element that still existed. Here you can see the cross section on the left side there where we got a 2.85 to one cut slope, which is a pretty flat cut slope. But we're talking about an area here that has now experienced a lot of in interesting precipitation events after long drought events and the ground turned a bit to mush and we have problems here. And we came to realize that, that the analysis here could be deeper Let's go to the next slide, actually. And this was the discussion we recorded that really got, and we recorded all this conversation and even had some design considerations and actions for the designers to consider. And that's where the, all this was recorded in the spreadsheet there. It's all documented, one-stop shopping. So we can, the designers can then see what we considered in this workshop and also maybe some suggestions to work on along the way. Next slide, please. And with that, I'm, I'm kind of out of time. I'm gonna pass this over to, to Sarah Gabe. So what, what's happening now is we've, we've handed this spreadsheet off to the designers for them to consider. Now the project has taken some twisted and turns since then, uh, but, but that's where we're headed now is to actually to compensate and mitigate those risks that we identified during the workshops. So over to Sarah to, to talk about uh, what we're doing next. Thanks, Sane. And so I'm just going to speak to the assessment that was done and um, any you know gaps um, or opportunities for um, improvement that we feel can be applied to the assessment. So next slide, please. 
Yeah, so just looking at those five hazard parameters and as well as uh, the elements at risks, I think uh, Jeff had called those the asset categories. Um, so there's, there's five and 14 of them. Just looking specifically at the caribou site, we have, there needs to be consideration for uh, additional parameters there. So in the case of the caribou, we saw that we, there was a lot of movement associated with a long duration of, of rain, and that's not reflected in the parameters that uh, just those five that have been highlighted. And similarly, looking at the elements at risk, they need to be specific to the site. So just an evaluation, I think Zane ran through that of the 14 that have been shortlisted, uh, five applied to this one. And we have examples of other projects where 14 may not be comprehensive enough and we need to add to it. So just really looking at the site specific uh, needs and whether those parameters are, are um, sufficient. Um, similarly, just looking at the risk assessment itself, we want something that's gonna be very repeatable and transparent and can be applied much more broadly. And each practitioner who does the work, you know, it's done in a very consistent manner. So looking at the work that was done, um, the consequence, uh, it's very, I guess, vague. It has limited guidance in terms of what that means and from, you know, one project team to the next, the interpretation of that may be different. So the ministry has, you know, different um, different examples of how we've uh, we, we've done this for other um, other prioritization work, such as our rockfall hazard rating system or how we do seismic retrofit. And so what we tend to look at is. Um, consideration for the road classification, whether it's a primary highway or a low volume road. We consider, consider the operational impact, you know, if it's a couple hours to clean up material, if it's, you know, a closure that's uh, days, weeks, months. When we had the November uh, atmospheric river events, we saw that the closure of one month on the Coquihalla was pretty catastrophic. Um, and then consideration if the access, the road itself is just a single access to a community and that if it is closed, it would, would be cut off. So the ministry is working through uh, further defining uh, what those different scoring levels will mean from a very low impact to a very high. Next slide, please. And similarly, uh, both Zane and, and um, Jeff have talked about the probability. So we're here, we're looking at the trend, you know, is it getting wetter? Is it getting hotter? Um, the approach that was taken here for the Kersley Dale, so I've copied over the, the Kersley Dale numbers. And just looking in that first column, the one day rainfall went from 23 mils to 25 to 29. And Zane's correct, the trend, you know, it continues to go up. And so it was uh, scored three, four, five. And that's very conservative. Jeff had uh, what he had shown in his slide was looking at um, a percentage increase. And he, his, his slide spoke to you know 50%, 100%. So the ministry is looking at putting bounds on what those scoring guidelines would be. And so that will just help as well for consistency on that end. That's it for my presentation.